And greetings, my friends, patriots, lovers of democracy, truth, and justice, believers in peace, freedom, and the American way. Boy, did the Supreme Court... <laughs> It was, it was one of those uh, Dewey Beats Truman moments for CNN and many of the other networks. Uh, yes, uh, we find that under the, under the Commerce Clause, uh, this would not be constitutional. But David Lyle is on the line with us. He is the director and senior counsel of Courts Matter, parts of, uh, part of Media Matters for America, mediamatters.org, the uh, website. Uh, an expert on the Constitution for 10 years, served as the deputy director of the American Constitution Society for Law and Policy. And welcome to our program, David. It's great to be with you, Tom. Thank you for joining us. You want to give us a, a snapshot of what happened this morning, or what the decision was, rather? Well, I mean, the, the very simplest version is that the Affordable Care Act was upheld. Mm -hmm. uh, not in the way a lot of people had anticipated. Um, the, the court did say, a majority of the court, the five conservative justices, which still includes Chief Justice Roberts, who is extremely conservative, uh, did say that the act would be invalid if the only support for it were the Commerce Clause, but Chief Justice Roberts joined with the four uh, more progressive ju uh, justices to say that there was uh, a constitutional basis for the act in Congress's tax power. Which is probably why Mrs. Uh, Scalia and Alito a few days ago were so grumpy on the bench. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they, they could have known what was coming. Yeah, it, it may well be. Uh, your your thoughts on the on the rationale? I mean, th this the the Obama administration went out of their way not to argue, although they did it once in a lower court that it was a tax. But generally speaking, not to argue that this was a tax. They didn't want to acknowledge that it was politically uh, dynamite, and and Romney is using that right now. And it seems like Scali or excuse me, that uh, Justice Roberts did in this case something similar to what he did in Citizens United, which is. Uh, going beyond the scope of the original arguments to find a, a, a rationale or an explanation. Uh, a, is that, do you think, an accurate analysis? And B, if so, why did he do that? Could it be that the court has gotten such a bad reputation since Bush v. Gore and Citizens United that he's concerned about his legacy? Well, I, I think on the, on the tax issue, um, you know, that is something that the administration had pretty consistently uh, argued in court. Now, you're right. Uh, in the campaign and in some of their public pronouncements, political figures in the administration had stayed away from the tax label. But uh, in the litigation, um, the, the administration had been pretty consistent in saying that the tax power was an alternative reason to uphold the law. They had, also, including before the Supreme Court. That's right. It was, I didn't it realize was, that. It was very okay. much part of the arguments before okay. the court. Um, and in fact, I mean, that, that's what's really been kind of silly about the whole thing already. I mean, we're, we're all along with the, you know, the superheated rhetoric about the death of freedom in America, all the mandate has ever been about. It was not that uh, you would be arrested and put in jail. You would be uh, taken out and beaten if you didn't if you didn't have health insurance. All it ever was was this very modest tax penalty that if people uh, have the money to pay for insurance, uh, choose not to pay for it, then they would be subject to a modest penalty capped at two and a half percent of income. That's all this has ever been about. So I think it's completely appropriate that it was upheld under the tax power. So 2.5% of income could be a big deal for Mitt Romney or the Koch brothers if they decided <laughs> not to buy insurance on principle. That's true. That's true. They'll, they'll have a tough decision to make. Although I suspect they, uh, rich as they are, I suspect they have pretty good health insurance. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm guessing you're absolutely mm -hmm. right. Uh, how do you have a tax for which there's no enforcement mechanism? Well, I think it'll be enforced by the IRS. So... Uh, People, I think it'll be deducted from uh, refunds of people, is my understanding. I'm not, I'm not an mm -hmm. expert on, on the, that part of the implementation, but I, I think it'll, it'll be administered uh, just like any other tax. Okay. And then Medicare, Me or Medicaid, rather. Medicaid is the joint federal-state program to provide for poor people in the states and, and, and people who work at Walmart, people whose income is below a certain threshold and... And uh, the states, uh, under, under the, the Obamacare as written, if I understand this correctly, if the states did not take federal funds and then match up, pony, pony up matching, grant, uh, matching amounts from, the, from their own revenues to expand their Medicaid program, then they would lose all of the federal funds. They'd lose their entire Medicaid program, which would be disastrous politically for a state. 
Um, if they could just cap it where it is right now, though, which I, I believe Scott Walker's already said he intends to do in Wisconsin, then, you know, there's not so much of a political fallout. And uh, that's what the Supreme Court has allowed. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. Uh, states will, it, it, I think there's still a little bit of uncertainty as to how these things are going to play out. But I, I believe what the way most people understand it now is states will have a choice to either participate in the Medicaid expansion or not. If they do choose to participate, they can't take that money and spend it on something else, either another uh, kind of health care program or a non-health care program. They have to implement the Medicaid expansion just as the Affordable Care Act uh, requires. But they do have the choice not to participate in the expansion at all, and they, and they don't risk losing as you said, the rest of their Medicaid funding. Right. And, so, and I think it's, it's just, I think it's a real um, open question how that's going to play out politically. I think probably different, different ways in different states. Some states will be very eager, I think, to uh, obtain the additional funding and provide additional coverage. I think probably in some states uh, there'll be the political elite will decide that it wants to make score some kind of political point about uh, standing up to the administration and will refuse the money and you know pass up an opportunity to help a lot of people in the state and in other states there will be a battle uh, about which which of those two courses to follow yeah well after all it's just poor people being hurt right I mean that that seems to be the Republican rationale these days but isn't this doesn't this run the risk in a way of producing the same kind of problem, which is still a real problem, but it's been somewhat ameliorated by federal educational assistance, of because education typically was locally funded and then backstopped by state funds, that if you were not a member of the Lucky Sperm Club, if you were born into a really poor area of Appalachia or some you know urban part of America, your schools were terrible. Whereas if you were born into you know an affluent community, uh, you know just coincidence of fate, uh, you, you could go to very good schools. And so we do, we're trying to equalize that with the federal education grants and, and standards. Um, isn't this sort of the, the health care for the poor equivalent of that? Well, and and I, couldn't I, that, that kind of outcome be produced by this? That Well, I think that's right. I think that, that's what the Act was originally trying to avoid by, by expanding uh, Medicaid um, everywhere for everyone. Um, and I, and I, as I suspect you're right. I think the, the states that are doing the worst job now of providing coverage for their people are probably going to be the first to get in line to, again, try to score the political point. So the, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's certainly that, that's, not a, that's not part of the happy news from today. Yeah. Uh, it, it, is this the sort of, um, presumably this is the sort of thing Congress could easily revisit were it inclined. Now, you know, it, it would take a House of Representatives not owned by the Tea Party, but that would be the solution, would it not? I think that's right. There's, there's ways of working around it. Um, if, as you say, the political will is there at the, at the federal level, there are a couple of, I mean, the, the way the court uh, tweaked the the Medicaid part, which is under Congress's spending power, mm. and also the the vote by the five justices, including Chief Justice Roberts, to say that the uh, mandate would not have been valid under the Commerce Clause. Those are two very uh, potentially very significant and potentially extremely worrisome um, changes to the law that we're just going to have to wait and see what the justices do with them, but those could cause real problems down the road. Yeah, well, we will keep an eye on this very closely. David Lyle, MediaMatters.org. David, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me, Tom. And for the very lucid and cogent explanation. Much appreciated.